So next we have our main talk. Generally, this uh, this can be a person who is outside of the community, but today we've got somebody who's inside of the community who's going to give us a talk. Um, T.C. Smythe, who has given us talks such as reproductive freedom before, so I'm super excited because she's going to hit the evolution of the war on drugs today. I'm speaking to you today uh, on a topic that's pretty controversial and it's somewhat technical. So you should know from the get-go that I don't hold a degree of any kind. Uh, the data that supports this talk was gathered as part of a research paper I completed toward my nursing degree at Houston Community College. I do happen to support uh, marijuana legalization, but as a nurse, I will never be able to use marijuana even if it becomes legal everywhere for everyone. Although the drug war does encompass over 400 controlled substances, most of this talk is going to be about marijuana. The story of marijuana best illustrates the irrational nature of American drug policy. It's also been used by humans for about a 10,000 year stretch. It has the most consumers. It accounts for more than half of all drug arrests, and it's the only non-narcotic in Schedule I of the DEA's regulatory domain. Marijuana is pretty interesting, even if you don't use it. <laughs> so the support for prohibition, which is essentially what we're talking about, has waxed and waned quite a bit, even in my own lifetime. But despite all the high-minded justifications behind the drug war, the policies and tactics applied to it are always the same. And the end result each time is the same. It strengthens the criminal control of an unregulated, multi-trillion dollar global commodities market. So this talk is really more about the why of the drug war rather than the what or the how. I have a little bit of skin in the game because in 2014, I bought a small vacation home in Colorado. <laughs> All right, uh, and when I complete my degree and my husband retires, I'll be practicing the nursing trade in a place where state laws tolerate marijuana, but federal laws don't, even if my patients request it. And uh, by the way, this place is available to my fellow Oasins if you care to go and do any research of your own. <laughs> In 2002, the voters in Colorado began to complain about the cost of enforcing federal laws and they gently amended their constitution to decriminalize the possession of an ounce of marijuana if it were held by a marijuana patient. And in 2012, they voted again to legalize it outright for recreational use. And they modeled their new law after existing laws that govern the sale of alcohol, but there were many unanticipated challenges that took them by surprise. They thought the sky would fall, at least the lawmakers did, uh, but since January 2014, the Department of Justice recorded an 11% decrease in Colorado's crime rate. And I know two years of data are not enough to establish a statistically uh, valid trend, but when you combine that fact with the 20 failed sting operations in a row and $3 billion of clean transactions, that begins to constitute a trend. Now, right before the law was passed, 83 townships voted to prohibit the commercial growing, processing, and sales within their borders. It was a little bit like a mini states' rights action. They opted out, and that's okay. They were afraid of what might happen to the characters of the communities where they lived. <clears throat> it's real important not to confuse uh, psychotropic compounds like the THC in weed with psychedelic compounds you find in LSD or mushrooms. The former, marijuana only, alters the mood, and the latter can produce visual or auditory hallucinations. The government knows the difference, but they willfully and routinely mischaracterize marijuana as a psychedelic or a narcotic substance because misleading the public makes it easier to portray it as a dangerous drug in need of regulation. But in 10,000 years, THC has never killed a single person, unlike every single other drug in all five schedules of the DEA's domain. Narcotics are addictive drugs that in excessive doses can cause stupor, coma, or convulsions. Stupor, I get, 
But unlike the rest of Schedule 1, marijuana does not produce comas or convulsions, nor is it physically addictive. But there's a valid argument that psychological problems can form around it based on a person's predilection to become addicted to anything else. The fact that marijuana is not, nor has ever been, a dangerous narcotic would vex the government's attempts to remove it from the public domain. But our government wasn't the first to attempt the prohibition of a plant. Prohibition as a concept is traceable all the way back to Abrahamic history. In the book, <laughs> in the book of Genesis, in chapter 2, God said to Adam and Eve, Of every tree in the garden thou mayest freely eat, but of the tree of knowledge of good and evil thou shalt not eat. For the day thou eatest thereof, thou shalt surely die. But they ate the fruit and lived anyway. <laughs> If Adam and Eve had died as guaranteed by God, the story would have ended right there, right along with three major religions. But apparently God was only a little angry, and Adam and Eve were deported to the land of Nod, where they lived uneventfully for the next 900 years. <laughs> it struck me as a little unfair that in chapter 1 of Genesis, they had been granted permission to use every single seed-bearing plant as they wished, without exception. And this story, as a whole, contains four things. The first two lies ever told, the first sting operation, the first criminal conviction, and the first deferred adjudication. <laughs> All because of an arbitrary prohibition. It's also amusing if you realize that the real pusher, remember the serpent? He got away. <laughs> Now granted, the forbidden fruit was not mind-altering, but if God couldn't enforce this simple prohibition, what makes governments think they can do any better? The close of Genesis, all was forgiven. Human beings were free to exercise dominion over every other fruit, and even each other, at least until the 14th century. Uh, there's an old Arabic proverb that says, a pipe full of keef before breakfast gives a man the strength of a hundred camels. I know, right? <laughs> But apparently the Arabs uh, were probably the first to prohibit marijuana specifically. Uh, in medieval Saudi Arabia, I forgot to show you that cool Arab picture there. Is that slide six? Okay. In medieval Saudi Arabia, Emir Sudan Shikumi of Jonima pronounced kunbihindin, cannabis, haravat, banned, in 1378. Not only did he prohibit its use, he burned all the crops of it that he could find, and he pulled out the teeth of anybody caught using it. And I thought meth was bad for your teeth. <laughs> anyway, a hundred years later, uh, Catholic Pope Innocent VIII decreed that cannabis was a component of the satanic black mass, and female witches used it to stimulate their appetites for food and sex. <laughs> well, he, he might have had something there, but he also claimed it was part of a flying ointment that allowed them to levitate or fly through the air on wooden poles. <laughs> Moving ahead to 1839, the drug war kind of took a 500 year break in there. Uh, Walter O'Shaughnessy uh, brought cannabis to Ireland from India. The Hindu physicians taught him how to make tinctures from it, and he went on tour to lecture about its uses and sell his own preparations of it. And it's pretty fair to say he deserves credit for being the first pusher of weed in Western culture. Things went pretty well for cannabis until about the 20th century when it became uh, negatively associated with Mexican migrants who were moving into the Southwest. Field hands had all the same aches and pains that their white counterparts did, but they couldn't afford the expensive patent medicines that were being produced. They contented themselves to smoke the unprocessed leaf. But Caucasian disapproval of their method of ingesting it uh, was an excuse for the government to enact racist immigration policies. After all, civilized people didn't smoke their medicine, they got it from a bottle. And that's when politicians started referring to cannabis as marijuana. And just like that, the character of prohibition suddenly included a racial component. And to get rid of the Chinese, they did the same thing with opium. Now, during that same time, there were lots of overdoses involving laudanum. And maybe some people here are old enough to remember what laudanum is, but it was an opium-based cough syrup. 
uh, in those days, doctors didn't prescribe that stuff. You got it from a, uh, an apothecarist. And dosage instructions on the bottles were so vague and well, too vague for an illiterate consumer to take safely. Many of them had uh, exotic ingredients, some of which were inert, uh, genuinely dangerous, absent, or unlisted. Uh, liniments designed for veterinary use would certainly get rid of your joint pain along with your liver. <laughs> so. As a result, the focus of the drug war moved again, away from immigration, uh, towards safety and morality. And the 1906 Pure Food and Drug Act was meant to address manufacturing and labeling standards for foodstuffs and patent medicines, but the National Druggist Association opposed it because they were making a fortune off of tinctures of cannabis. Under pressure from the temperance movement, they agreed to sell it as a poison in the hopes that consumers would be more careful when handling it. A few years later, the Harrison Narcotic Tax Act introduced the mandatory prescription for cannabis, but predictably, thousands, thousands of scripts were written for uh, just addiction maintenance. And in 1919, there were so many fake prescriptions that the act was updated to make the prescriber responsible for their patient's actions. This was the same year the temperance movement celebrated the prohibition of alcohol. They did that for 13 years. They played cat and mouse with the bootleggers until prohibition was declared a failure and it got repealed in 1932. And the temperance movement had a huge case of butt hurt over that, but Congress hung on to their support by passing the Uniform State Narcotic Act. That began to tax cannabis prescriptions. And by 37, uh, doctors lost their prescriptive authority altogether and marijuana became entirely illegal. The act was written so that both the users and the dealers would get stuck between a rock and a hard place. Weed was already illegal and you could go to jail for it, but if a dealer failed to use a registered tax stamp, their possession sentences would be doubled. And if a buyer was caught holding without a purchase receipt, the state would get them the same way. And in 1941, cannabis was removed from the national formulary. The effect of that was that you could no longer have cannabis researched in any kind of controlled fashion. You couldn't even grow hemp at that point. They had to make an exception during World War II to make a hemp rope for the Navy during the war effort. And in 67, oh yeah, in 1951, the fines went up 400%. And in 67, President Johnson admitted finally, these acts raise an insignificant amount of revenue and expose very few marijuana transactions to public view. This has become, in effect, a criminal law. Now, this, oh, here's a picture of the, uh, the stamp the dealer had to have. That was the stamp the buyer had to have. That was the first guy that ever got busted for dealing. His name was Samuel Caldwell. And there was his customer, Moses Baca. And they got busted in Denver. <laughs> <laughs> Samuel got four years for dealing. Uh, Baca, I think, got 18 months for possession. Yeah. By 1970, even ordinary citizens recognized that the 1937 Act was a little bit of a violation of the Fifth Amendment since it required registered dealers to incriminate themselves by surrendering their stock for inspection. But they also came to believe that some drugs might not be as bad as others. In response, Congress replaced all of the previous acts with the Controlled Substances Act. And from that point forward, the drug war would become a political fixture in every single election to follow. President Nixon declared the nation at war with drugs and his strategy was to influence the Supreme Court to increase police interdiction and punishment powers so that pre the, the previously illegal practice of entrapment was recodified as a drug state. And uh, to empower the police, uh, they gave them no-knock warrants, which were essentially an end run around the protections of the Fourth and Fifth Amendments. In an executive order, Nixon unilaterally placed cannabis into the DEA's Schedule I list of most dangerous drugs, and he appointed Governor Raymond Schaefer of Pennsylvania to lead a Blue Ribbon Commission to rubber stamp his intentions with a study. Who remembers the Schaefer, who remembers the, uh, Schaefer Commission? A few people? Yeah. 
Anyway, Nixon must have felt utterly betrayed when the commission concluded that personal use should be legalized outright. Nixon ignored their reports. He canceled the study, and 43 years later, the drug remains temporarily in Schedule I without review. <laughs> yep. Uh, the CSA defines how drugs are classified, added, or removed from the DEA schedule, but this, despite requests from Congress, the AMA, and the Schaefer Commission, marijuana was never demoted from Schedule I. Now, drugs are divided into five categories based on increasing risk and decreasing medical benefit. Schedule V drugs are the least regulated and include things like uh, cough syrup, like Robitussin, your over-the-counter medications. Schedule IV drugs include Xanax and Valium because they begin to require a prescription. Schedule III drugs are even worse. That's mostly anabolic steroids and things that have a potential for abuse. Schedule II drugs are Percocet, Morphine, Opium, Codeine, Cocaine, Methamphetamine, and Truth Serum. Now, all those drugs in Schedules II through V are considered less harmful uh, to people than marijuana, which is on Schedule I. It's right there next to heroin, LSD, peyote, quaaludes, and ecstasy. And these substances are said to have no safe uh, or medical benefit, even if you're closely supervised. And at the beginning of Reagan's Just Say No campaign in 1980 or so, high school seniors, who are the leading indicator for the problem, were using at a rate of about 12%, and they were paying about $75 an ounce for marijuana. There were maybe 25,000 people in prison at that time uh, for marijuana possession. Clinton continued the policy, and he jailed 600,000 people, which drove the price up to $300 an ounce, which at the time was more than you paid for an ounce of gold. Now today, 900,000 people are in prison only for marijuana possession, so high school demand must be way up around 100%, right? It's 12%. So fast forward to 2012, President Obama and Attorney General Eric Holder agreed in principle that marijuana should probably be demoted from the DEA Schedule 1, and they even de-emphasized enforcement, but so far nothing at all has been done about it. Except when you talk about the states, because 24 of them authorized medical marijuana or they decriminalized recreational marijuana. 55% of Americans now live in states where pot is considered legitimate medicine, and in five of those states, citizens can grow or consume their own marijuana. The state will not hassle them, but the feds still will. But a license to sell weed is no guarantee that profits will follow because each production stage along the way, growing, processing, and selling, each enjoy a 75% tax markup. Vendors can't deduct rent, payroll, or capital expenses, nor can they deposit their revenues in a domestic or a foreign bank. It's all cash and carry. Ironically, the banking challenges are the only reason Big Pharma hasn't stepped in to take over the entire game. They're allowing the independent growers to take all the initial risks associated with the new laws, set up all the new markets, and take all the risks of operating in a legal limbo. Now to say that we're safer with prohibition than without is a flight of fantasy because you know it's not about the tainted drugs or the violent drug dealers and the guns and everything. It's because the states employed a paramilitary police force to address what essentially is a healthcare problem. Um, SWAT team deployments used to be rare, but now we have 40,000 a year. These are called no-knock raids and this makes civilians 300 times more likely to be killed by a policeman than by a terrorist, okay? Um, and this is all on account of the possession of a drug that never killed anybody. <laughs> so anyway, a drug conviction, if you get one, it renders you ineligible for food, education, and housing aid. And even if the uh, user is evicted, his family gets evicted along with him. And if his third conviction for any crime involves marijuana, he is mandatorily sentenced to the greatest time available. Um, there was a guy in Tulsa who uh, was the victim of a no-knock raid because somebody had informed that there might be meth at his house, an unnamed source. Oh, there's meth over there. Police get there, they don't find any meth, 
that they found this one marijuana plant that the guy was growing for his arthritis. And because it was his third conviction, they sentenced him to 93 years. There's at least 14 of those cases, people sitting in prison for marijuana possession for, for life. And uh, the Department of Justice won't publish those statistics separately, but you can get it from the ACLU's website. Uh, this is all because of, this, of the three strikes rule. And it's really a tired statistic to have to say this again, but the cost of incarceration really exceeds the cost of education by a lot. Tuition at my community college where I go runs me about three grand a year for tuition for a full load, but the cost of housing an inmate is over $45,000 a year. And since the average sentence for marijuana possession is 30 months, taxpayers commit $112,000 each time a user is sent to jail. And this is part of why we get 20 prisons built for each university right now. So what fuels all this are a bunch of myths that people uh, just sort of eat up from the media. Nobody ever checks their own facts. But there's a number of myths that have been perpetuated to the just say no movement. And one of them is that minorities use cannabis more than whites, which is why there's more of them in jail, right? That's what we've been told, right? But as you can see here, see blacks and whites and Hispanics use marijuana at roughly the same rate, but who gets arrested and jailed? The blacks and the Mexicans, right? Oh, there's the graph. Who smokes pot? They're equal. Who gets arrested? Black people. Who's in prison? Mostly black people followed by whites follow. It's not proportionate. Mexicans and Hispanics enjoy a lot more police attention than their fair share, but the statistics on them are a little bit incomplete because the Justice Department lumps Hispanic data in with white data so you can't parse it out. And here's another myth. Everybody has an equal chance at justice. Well, you think if you get busted, you're gonna get private representation if you have the money or if you're smart. But only 3% of drug cases are argued for the poor by private counsel. But they're still convicted 77% of the time. And public defenders fail their clients 86% of the time. And if a private client is found guilty, his sentence is on average 50% longer. It's like to punish him for trying to buy his way out with slick representation. But in either case, even if you get exonerated, courts don't refund your legal fees, which average about $15,000 for a first-time marijuana defense. Another myth. Marijuana belongs in Schedule One because it's as dangerous as heroin. Well, the DEA's own administrative law judge said, there are simply no credible reports to suggest that consuming marijuana has caused a single death. It's estimated that lethal dosage ratio, the LD50, is around 1 to 40,000. And in layman's terms, this means that in order to induce a death, a person would have to consume 1,500 pounds of it in 15 minutes. <laughs> Give me a minute. <laughs> I'm telling you. And uh, another myth, medical marijuana users aren't really sick, they just want to get high. Well, perhaps a few of them do, but medical marijuana doesn't produce a high. And because it can't be researched legally, all patients can do are experiment on themselves with street drugs. Now, the hypocrisies. In 92, the DEA administrator advocated private research, but instead the agency granted itself an exclusive patent for cannabis as a neuroprotectant, something doctors said it could do all along. But then it shut down that research. But why bother with a patent? Patents are only useful if you intend to collect royalties from a third party. Drug use by senior lawmakers. Our last five presidents have all been drug users, and so was Congressman Trey Radel. This isn't Trey Radel. <laughs> Trey Radel of North Carolina was busted in 2013 for cocaine possession right after he voted to drug test his own state's food stamp recipients. It's a good thing Radel wasn't applying for student aid because he would have been turned down. But if he had only been a rapist or a murderer, those programs would have been available to him without prejudice. Now the broader implications of non-action versus action are binary. I'm gonna go ahead and let you read the credits while I do the closer, okay? <laughs> These are my sources for this talk, 
okay? So, no, I'm not degreed, but I am well supported. Uh, the broader implications of non-action versus action are kind of binary. If nothing is done, the prison industry will continue to grow at the expense of taxpayers, students, and minorities in particular. People will continue to die in the black markets, and our rights and liberties will be eroded because elected officials refuse to deal with reality on reality's terms. On the other hand, if legalization becomes the trend, crime may fall as it has done in the test markets, and the sickest of the sick won't have to experiment on themselves with street drugs. This war has evolved from a religious control mechanism to a race war, to a political football, and finally, to an economic necessity for the prison industry, which is the fastest growing segment of the American economy. Over two million jobs in the prison industry right now are supported by judges who send people to jail for weed. Half of them in jail for drugs are in there for weed. And there's 2.3 million people in prison, 1.8 for drugs, 900,000 for weed. Do the math, $45,000 a year each. All right. But the government reacts to addiction by spending close to $200 billion a year, essentially starting an expensive game of whack-a-mole. And at the same time, users are spending $150 billion a year to smoke pot. So this war is kind of tough to win if you insist on fighting both sides of it. And uh, what are we fighting it with? Well, it's a medical problem, but we're using a paramilitary uh, source for the solution to a medical problem. And that's all the time I have, except for Q&A. Thanks a lot, guys. I'll just leave the credits up in case you're still reading them. Oh, we got a hand up. Quick, quickie, quickie, two, two, but two quickies. What, what did you say is, is involved in getting uh, getting marijuana off the Schedule 5? And number two, schedule one. Schedule one. I meant, the schedule Attorney General has to order it. The Attorney General. Yeah. And then we should what probably was, use the wireless for the question if I can get a runner. But what, yeah. was, what was the uh, substance that, that killed the five research subjects in France a few days ago? I have not. I thought that was, a, I thought that was THC. Yeah. I've been working. Well, there there are edible. T you can die from THC if you run into somebody and hit them. You know. Um, but uh, it, now they're having a little bit of trouble with edibles because they act very slowly, and people tend to eat a little too much. But I I've been working on this paper for two weeks, so I don't know what happened in France five days ago. I'm, just sorry. I'm sorry. I, I know. Uh, wait, let's uh, wait for the microphone to come around. There we go. Okay, in France, uh, the substance has, has cannabis in the name, but it's not because it's a cannabinoid. It, it, it uh, connects to cannabis receptors in the brain. Oh, it exploits it cannabis receptors? Yeah, that makes DHC. sense. All right. I was just wondering, um, in all of your research, what did you find uh, as far as invalidating the uh, gateway drug myth, uh, that if users start with marijuana, but then things get really heavy really quick. Well, I did. My research didn't go in the direction of the gateway drug. I was basically just researching the history of the drug war itself. Um, I can say that alcohol is at least as bad a gateway drug as any. Because I tried alcohol before I ever tried pot, which is the gateway. The, the initial gateway for me would have been alcohol, right? And then, of course, later on, I, I ran across pot and tried that. You kind of grow out of it sometimes. Or cigarettes or oxygen. Cigarettes could be as well. Yeah, but no, I don't have any data on what constitutes a, ga a gateway drug or how effective they are. Oh, we got yeah. another one back here. I can't read your sources well enough to see. <laughs> I see, yeah. Uh, I'm happy to post uh, the, the sources onto the Houston Oasis Facebook page where you can get out of real. I mean, I'll, I'll just post the notes I wrote too. That's no problem. Well, I, I was trying. Is this on? It's on. I, I was trying to see if you had read um, Chasing the Scream as part of your. No, there were that is thousands a, of things out Chasing there. Chasing the Scream is a really, really good book if you're interested in this topic. It's new in the last year. Okay. I, I loaned it to my pharmacist, and now I've loaned it to a policeman in my guitar group. Well, so I'll make a recommendation to you, too. If you're on YouTube, look up uh, uh, Nathan Edelman, E-D-E-L-M-A-N-N. -N. 
he uh, proposes a middle ground approach, which is a harm reduction model that I was really impressed with. He's not for ending the drug war or outright legalization. He's more about addressing the fact that if people are going to use uh, the medicines they come across ought to be safe and that there are things that we can do very cheaply as a society to make, to, uh, while we're trying to get people off the habit, at least make the habit less damaging uh, while you're stuck in it. So needle exchange programs in New York for heroin, things like that, where you don't end up exacerbating the problems with hepatitis C or AIDS or anything else. Uh, those are the kind of programs that are in the middle ground. Well, I think that's about all the time we have. Well, well real quickly, Chasing the Scream goes just the Hundred Year War in the United States, and the guy researched all over the world, and he starts with the um, first prosecution against Billie Holiday because oh, she wouldn't yeah. stop singing Chasing the, uh, she wouldn't stop singing Strange Fruit, right. which annoyed the government. Yes, it did. <laughs> Thanks a lot, guys. We can talk more about this a bunch.